What is going on everybody? It is Alex coming back at you with another video and today we're going to be giving you guys the real top 10 edge rushers in the NFL draft. If you guys are new, would love for you guys to stick around, like, comment, subscribe. You guys know how to use YouTube at this point. I wish I could have done these sooner as you guys, if you guys are following, uh, all my files got deleted and you know, it's been a little bit of an uphill grind having to rebuild those. It's about 50 hours of work. You guys know I go to school, but that ain't an excuse not to give you guys good content. So I worked my ass off. I want to make sure you guys got this top 10 list. Glad that I got it together. And now let's get it right to you guys. Um, usually some people like to go 10 to one. I think the top five is, or like the top 10 is really fun. I think the more fluctuation is down the list. So why not start where we know what's best? Uh, Will Anderson is going to be the best guy in the class. I could start it at 10, but Again, I honestly think discussing in depth those more mid-round players that are going to potentially be those difference makers that you don't really see coming, that's going to be where more of the meat is. And honestly, I think everybody's seen Will Anderson dominate for years on end at this point. He has a great frame at above 250 pounds. He has very solid arm length. That's a very consistent theme with this entire draft class, and I love it. And you guys are going to get really pissed off with the order here of the guys. I just have to be completely frank you're going to see a top six that are all in my top 12 overall. I legitimately think this class is awesome and kick-ass. I also have some dudes who are very much my guys. So you'll see my own flair in this. But Will Anderson, he has disappeared for halves of games here and there. They use him as a two-gap defender, which you guys don't know what that is. Basically, he stands and waits and reads whether he should go one gap or another. And that's not very good based on his skill set. He was playing probably around that 245 mark there. Even at 250, I'd rather have a bigger guy who can plug two holes, and I'd rather let someone who's 250 or 255 and under decide on one gap and just get to the quarterback, because when he did, he was so awesome. Unbelievable bend, unbelievable twitchiness, great use of his hands. He's a super polished prospect. I think he'll be better in the NFL than he was in college, and that's why he's my number one player in the draft. So, obviously, I give a comp to Khalil Mack. These grades are not fully up to date, but I, these rankings are. So, remember, look at those grades. Have a little pinch of salt, or like take a little pinch of salt. Uh, but the dream fits. They don't necessarily line up exactly with where the draft is, but I wanted to blend it where, of course, I mean, like, sure, if he ends up on a team like the Bills, it's going to kick ass. But I want to make sure it's relatively close enough to where it's within the range of feasibility and it's a really good fit. Uh, Lions are going to be one of those teams I would love for him to go to. Him and Aiden Hutchinson, kind of the uh, lightning and the thunder there. The Eagles, I mean, they brought back essentially everybody except the one guy they probably should have tried to prioritize. My personal opinion, I'd rather bring back a 25-year-old, 26-year-old safety who has a lot of moxie, but that's a conversation for another day. And then the Panthers, obviously that second uh, edge spot, I don't think that's where they would go, but it's a dream fit, not a realistic fit. I think he's a great system fit. I would love to see him across from Brian Burns. That's why I include three teams, not one, because the other two are more realistic th fits. Obviously, Seattle in there as well. Uh, number two is still going to be Miles Murphy. I had him 1A and 1B, and you guys can still see the grade for Miles Murphy is higher. But again, that's not adjusted yet. We haven't seen the numbers, and you know, based off his play this year, he definitely is going to take a drop. There's a big difference between Khalil Mack and Robert Quinn, and uh, to be fair, they used to play on the same team, if I'm not mistaken, on the Bears. But, I mean, Miles Murphy, you look at any tape but this year. Like, you look at Boston College 2021. Just watch that game. He takes it over. Unbelievable power. Sitting tackles on their ass. And he doesn't do it just in that game. He did it across 2021. And he does have some stints of doing that last year. But he totally fell off. That scares me. But... I do think that we can get that old self out, and I'm willing to take a shot on that. He has an amazing frame, 258 pounds at six foot five. You know, that's a very solid build. He has great IQ. He's very good against the run. He's the perfect two-gap defender that I was talking about. Like, if he worked at Alabama, I think that his two-gap usage, I think if he kind of switched, actually, uh, roles with uh, Will Anderson, he could have had a better career there at Alabama just because I do think he had that IQ and run stuffing ability and that size to be able to handle it a little bit better than Will. But I still think Will will be the better player. Um, I wanted to toss in a couple new teams here. 
Obviously, I'm looking at the Kansas City Chiefs. If they want to be ballsy and move up, I don't think they will. Uh, that's going to be like one of my crazy fits, similar to how I chose the Panthers. You know, they're looking for, I mean, Spag obviously is looking for guys of this size and caliber. But two of the realistic ones, you can, well, I mean, it's not out of the question that he falls out of the top 20. But I do think he goes there. Uh, the Packers would be a great option for him to go to. The Texans, I'd love to see D'Amico Ryan maximize his potential. But uh, Robert Quinn feels like the right type of move. Robert Quinn was 265 and about 260 pounds. He was listed at 275. So his playing weight probably close to that 265 mark. Another team, the Eagles, would be pretty damn awesome. There's a lot of good teams where he can go to. And I really just hope he gets back to what he could be because this guy could be the best edge rusher in the class and he could have that Aiden Hutchinson level dominance because at the start of the year it was okay we got Will Anderson and Miles they're pretty much the better version of Aiden Hutchinson as well as Kayvon Thibodeau I'm hoping they can find a, uh, a way to make that happen but I'm not going to bet on that unless they go to the right situation so uh, that's why I like to put some dream fits there now this is a huge shocker I'm a big BJ Ojolari fan like, I am a monstrous fan. Now, can this change? Absolutely. And, of course, the more tape is watched, the more things can change. But I do think this is based on 2022 tape. This is not old. This is not something from the past. Like, he went from a 70 to up to a 79. Like, he did improve his game. And you guys know me. If I see a player who's improving his game, I'm going to give him credit. And you're going to see that's a common theme on a lot of players on this list. So I love BJ Ojolari. Again, that 250 pound frame, he's big enough. He can play around. And I do like that a lot. He's somebody where maybe his run defense doesn't match what you're looking for. And he does get lost from time to time. But you do see that pass rushing proficiency. He has great size. He has great athleticism. And, you know, the technique is something that not enough people talk about. But he will probably not make it into that first round. I would love to see him at that Eagles pick at 30. But with the, how many dudes are being brought back, I don't know if that's going to be their primary target. And that is a little bit confusing. But how he usually likes to go BPA and if bringing free agents in is the way to do it, this might be a great way to get a best player available at that spot. Another team, obviously the Panthers, that second round pick, you still are looking for that second edge rusher. And then obviously the Titans, you ended up probably, I think you lost Harold Landry, but you definitely lost Bud Dupree. And I think that would be um, a top notch option. i I'm tripping. I don't believe Harold Landry is gone, but Bud Dupree is, and I think he would be an amazing compliment there. Uh, just a really solid player overall, and somebody that I'm glad to know that there's guys like Marcus Whitman, that franchise guy, who love him, and I know I'm on the extreme. He's my number six player in the draft right now, thanks to one particular one being a complete uh, big red flag, but that's another topic for another day. Uh, next is going to be Felix on you, DK Uzama. Yes, I know I am an extremely high, huge fan of this, but the next three are in order and they are switch switchable. If you want to have one of these guys up at one spot versus the other, you guys can do it. But this is how they are on my board. I'm just displaying them this way. Felix has been great. He has been in the top 10 since the start of the year, but he improved his game. I love seeing a player who works on their craft. I just brought it up with BJ Ojolari as well. He's somebody who has great size, 255. You know, I, there's a lot of these guys who are not super undersized. And he does bring good polish to the game. He has 33 and a half inch arms. Like, I'm not worried. All these guys, I can say arm length is a plus. They are not a negative, maybe except Nolan Smith. But we'll talk about him in just a second. But yeah, just super consistent. I would say maybe his only issue is... He shows up versus the good tackles, which is really weird. Like Anton Harrison, they went at each other. That's a fun game to watch because I think they both won in their own out in their own rights. Like I think both of them had a really good game against each other. But these games versus lower level tackles, sometimes he disappears. And I don't know if maybe in his head, he doesn't turn it up to 100 when he knows the player across from him is not that good. But I know for a fact that this guy can just kick ass versus good players. To me, that's what matters because you're going to be playing against really good players in the NFL. Uh, some fans of teams might disagree about how good their tackles are, but I digress. I do think that a lot of these edge defenders run defense is not really their forte, but still better than it was at the start of the year. And, you know, we're not talking about Nolan Smith level athleticism here, 
uh, there's not really much that I think is that bad with Felix. Obviously, you guys know I'm a pain in the ass when it comes to grading. For so a 79 grade is incredible. I'm only going to give you guys comparisons when it is, you know, pretty solid comparison. I do look at other people's comparisons to see maybe I like that, maybe I don't. And um, if I want to parrot it, I'll give them credit for it. But I just didn't really find that. And I can see teams like the Dolphins, the Falcons, the Rams in the second round finding an edge rusher right there. Good value. And I just know that for a fact he's not going to be looked at as highly as the way I look at him. But he's a very good player. And I hope that he does get a little bit more of that love that he deserves. Next, we got Tyree Wilson again. So number 10 on my board, now number 11. And the next guy's number 12. Put them in any order you want. I know a lot of people love Tyree Wilson. He could definitely be my number two edge rusher. It really is totally up in the air. These guys are all top 12 on my big board. They're all phenomenal. Don't look at the rankings too harshly, okay? Like these guys are phenomenal. I believe he has 35 and a half inch arms at six foot six, 271. Incredible. And he had great production as a pass rusher. Here's the thing. He had great production as a pass rusher when he still needs to work on his pass rush mechanics. He still is raw in that aspect. He's not very polished. That's incredible. I got to give him credit where credit is due. I think he has the highest ceiling out of the bigger edge rushers in the class. Could that vault him to number two? Absolutely. But I didn't get to see him in the offseason. That scares me a little bit. But at the same time, if you don't show me something, that doesn't mean that it's a negative. It just shows that, you know, I cannot vault you to that edge two position. But for people who have him edge two, by all means, if you have him edge one, by all means, I totally understand. I just am not ready to put him there because there was a lot to work on. Again, production, great. Run defense, very solid in my opinion. And this guy can push a dude. So you have length and you have power. To me, that's two very good things. Uh, very good things to have in your arsenal. I think he's going to be great. Just don't worry about it. I think he'll be perfectly fine. Uh, he's definitely going to be a top 10, if not top five pick. You know, Seattle, I could totally see him going there. They've invested a lot in their defensive interior, so I don't really know if that's a priority. So maybe being able to get him as someone who could be that uh, edge rusher could be a really nice get for your franchise. Arizona obviously has been tied to him, even at number three overall. And then, you know, the Texans. If I can get D'Amico Ryan's hands on one of these dudes, I am probably going to take it. But yeah, no, super freaky. I've seen some comparisons for him, and, you know, I I really feel like he he needs to stand on his own. And I want to let him stand on his own. I think he's a singular prospect that can uh, represent himself. So, you know, really, like, tip my cap to him. He can't really bend for shit, but he's a 6'6", 271 guy with 36-inch arms down here. So I'll give him a pass on that. So next is going to be Nolan Smith. Yes, he is somehow edge six at number 12 on my big board. Uh, no, I'm a huge fan of Nolan Smith. Obviously, I don't need to bring up how he tests athletically. He's awesome. But here's the thing. He is also extremely strong. I'm sure if he put up a bench press before his uh, pectoral tear, he probably could have put up 20 to 30 reps. He really is super strong. Here's the issue. He uses his pectoral a lot when he does play the game. He got a lot better in his run defense. Got to give him credit for that. He worked on himself over the offseason from someone who I had zero faith in in terms of run defender. Look at his weight. He's 238. And he was probably going to be 230. So tip, uh, like tip my cap to him for being able to get up that weight and still be able to test the weight he did. But when you watch him play, a lot of it is him throwing players off. That requires a lot of chest activation. It makes sense why he got a pectoral tear. Like you do recruit that unit a lot. I think that he'll be perfectly fine, but it is something to note. And then obviously the size, even though he is 240 pounds, he is 240 pounds. So it's a good thing, but... So I guess it's more of a mitigation of a bad thing. Hassan Reddick is just the easy comp. He tested out very similarly, um, just better. But size, speed, really good technique, strength. I love it. So yeah, good for him right there. Uh, there's some common culprits up in here. You know, apparently if Jalen Carter is going to be a selection there for Seattle, which he was probably before today, uh, then he would have been a really cool guy to pair up. But that any team with the Georgia defenders is probably going to be pretty high on my list. So uh, next we got Will McDonald. 
So somebody who was my edge four starting out the year, he's had a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal offseason. And the thing is, he had a really bad regular season. His DC had no idea how the hell to use any of his players, which is why I'm higher on MJ Anderson than a lot of people. I think that his DC showed the like pretty much nothing about what they were capable of doing. That showed in Mobile when uh, Will Anderson was able to kick ass. You know, it was awesome to see that. He is still super thin, 239. Like, yeah, we talked about Nolan Smith um, at 238. And is that big difference? Obviously not. Nolan Smith looks really thin too. But Nolan Smith plays with a lot more strength than Will McDonald does. I think that's a big issue for me. He really does lack that power with his speed. But he does have crazy length of arms. I think it's 35 inches. And that is great for being able to you start setting the negotiation, so to speak, to set the engagement with that tackle. That's going to be key for being able to win at that size. So he has that. That is great. He has a great arm length to be able to deal with those tackles because, again, they get your hands on you. They can overpower you. So, again, being able to keep them at distance is super key for success, especially of a player of that size. That is awesome. And it made me so happy to see that. Obviously, you look at his arm like he looks like he has Kevin Durant arms. That's going to be what I say. Uh, but at the start of the year, I said he's 90% of Kayvon Thibodeau. Now, I think he's maybe 85% of Kayvon Thibodeau. Still totally worth a second round pick. And I love it. Again, teams that are culprits or teams that are used to looking at lighter edge rushers. Teams, obviously, who have had Hassan Reddick would be a pretty good start. As well as Harold Landry. So uh, that's the common culprits right there. Obviously, I do think he deserves a great bump because that great bump is based on 2022 tape. But yeah, he just didn't really do very much this past year. It's not really his fault, and he showed that. So that's great for Will and uh, Will McDonald. So going on to number eight is Keon White. There's a particular player I already know you guys are going to get pissed off about. We'll talk about him next. And um, there's something that I think everybody agrees on, and I'm a little bit more on the uh, safe side than the total belief side. So we'll get about that in just one moment. But Keon White at 285, can you call him an edge rusher? Uh, he played edge rusher. You know, he is potentially going to be a pure edge. I would hope that maybe he's slender down to 275 and, you know, be even more athletic. But for a 285 pound man, this dude moves. He moves. And, uh, you know, that's very, that's not like, you can't teach that. For a guy that size to be able to move like that, as a pure edge rusher, he does have the athleticism necessary. I just didn't really think he won very much in terms of his reps. That's my only issue is that the actual play was not nearly as good as what it should have been. I don't know if I can credit that to Georgia Tech or if I can credit that to him. If it's his issue, then I think this will fall significantly further. And I don't think he would make my top 10. But if it is due to Georgia Tech, this is going to be a great opportunity for him to take a step up. And um, I honestly think that he had he popped off at the Senior Bowl in terms of his mobility. He's chasing down quarterbacks that are extremely athletic. So, uh, yeah, no, very good for uh, Keon White right there. Again, just kind of underwhelming in terms of his overall play. And that's just something that I took away. Obviously, at 285, he's going to be able to put a little bit more juice into those tackles. Uh, you know, teams that are looking for bigger, more mobile um, and higher power edge rushers are probably going to be very intrigued with that. Teams that have had Bradley Chubb or Spag or else teams that, you know, similar to Marcus Davenport, like that bigger, freakier edge. So next, we got Lucas Van Ness. This is the guy where everybody's like, whoa, he's not in your top five. Uh, this is being very, very, very nice to him. I did not plan on having him in my top 10. And I put him here because I do kind of want to give him credit where credit is due. I already knew he was a really good athlete. The thing is, he is so unpolished. He is super raw. I don't understand why people aren't bringing that up enough. It's very intriguing to me. You know, he's a one-trick pony. You watch all the highlights. Is this dude blowing over a tackle? And that tackle is probably going to be someone who has anchor concerns. Paris Johnson is the culprit. I purposely watch games where players who I don't really fully believe in are at their best. I didn't necessarily see what I wanted to see from Lucas Van Ness. And again, he does lack that polish. Can you gain that in the NFL? 100%. And I think his ceiling in terms of, or the range in terms of his floor to ceiling might be the highest in the class. He tested out phenomenally. Great athlete. But we already knew that. I was surprised by him not getting up to 20 bench press reps. He, I think, got 17, which is one of the lowest from that day. 
which is a bit of a concern. But, you know, it is what it is. You can't have literally everything. Otherwise, this guy would be going number one overall like Trevon Walker did. But I don't think this is a Trevon Walker situation. Great frame, again, 272. But you are dealing with somebody who needs a lot more time. But he's very young, and a lot of people believe in him. I think if he goes to a place with someone who's a little bit more technically polished, you can see like Aiden Hutchinson being a great comparison, like a great partner to put him up with. Uh, that would be awesome. Pair him up with Bill Belichick. That'd be great. Obviously, Green Bay likes their fast, big edge rushers. So there are certainly some spots where he could shine. That's why I put him at nine instead of leaving him out of this. But his pure game tape, I'm sorry. I don't want one dude who can just bowl over a tackle because I can guarantee you, you look Trent Williams right in his eyes. You're getting planted on your ass. I do not care who you are. To be fair, every edge rusher does. But you look at a, at a tackle that can handle power, you are absolutely useless. And I am scared shitless of what happens when you take away that one move. I don't really see many other moves in his arsenal. It does scare the living hell out of me. But again... If he learns, and if he's in the right situation, he could be a superstar. I think the chances are lower than a lot of people say. And that's why he's here at number nine. Uh, I had to go into that one because a lot of people are going to be getting butthurt about that. And, you know, understandably so. I'm You don't watch the tape like all of us do. And the people who you probably trust are saying things that are different than what I'm saying. So, uh, you know, it is what it is. That's why I try to watch tape with you guys when I do find that time. But... Last but not least, this is my heartbreak. Um, I actually artificially put Isaiah McGuire in here as well. Uh, guys who I did drop out, Byron Young was supposed to make it here. Isaiah Foskey actually is tied at that same spot for tied 10. And then as well as um, I'm tripping on his name, Derek Hall from Auburn. Really good edge class, like really good edge class. Uh, definitely the most plentiful in my top 150. And if I'm going to be completely honest, um, I don't really have many guys who I want to put past 150 and I'm starting to get UDFA grades in that 150 to 200 range. So getting a little bit worried about the class depth, but that is again, a story for another time. Isaiah McGuire though, formerly my number two overall player. Again, you look at the tape. He's a fucking badass. He took Broderick Jones, the top 20 player on my board and took him to school. He taught him how to eat his own lunch. Like it was incredible. Please watch that game. Honestly, he pops off and at a 270 pound frame, he moves very, very well. The problem is the off season. I was excited to see him dominate at Mobile and I follow him on Instagram and I saw him posting all of his training stories, which one, at least you're training. You know, there's guys that we're talking about that apparently don't train, but here's the issue. I saw who he was training with and it was essentially no names. I used to train at a facility once owned by Kobe Bryant. So rest in peace, Mamba called sports Academy. They were known for having NFL draft prospects there. And what you saw is some really good ones trained together. And there's places that are built to train you properly. The players who Isaiah was not training with, or the Isaiah was training with were not close to this caliber. And it just showed, I don't know if it's because of a lack of finances or anything, but to me, it wasn't going balls, like going balls to the wall for something. And um, I hope it's not a monetary thing. And that would make me feel really bad if he couldn't just help himself by being able to afford that type of stuff. He did not test horribly at all. But when it comes to the senior bowl, he obviously didn't stand out remotely at the uh, combine did not really stand out at all. And Ultimately, you have to be able to stand up against good competition. And for me, the tape still matters. That's why he is here. He is still a top 80 prospect for me. And a lot of people have him a lot lower than that. But I do think if he hits his stride, he could be of that George Karloftis type. Has some great explosiveness, some good hand technique. And, um, you know, maybe not the most finesse type of guy. But, um, yeah, definitely do love what I can get from him. Uh, the Bears, Packers, I mean, I already talked about the Packers and Saints looking for those bigger athletic edge rushers. I think the Bears would be a really cool spot to be able to snag him with one of those mid-round picks. Unfortunately, I do think he goes to day three. Just nothing spectacular on paper. Um, at least he had good production. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we find that guy who was number two on my board again. But 
I am starting to think that the chances are starting to get a little bit slimmer. But the tape matters the most. So maybe when all is said and done, he's going to end up kicking ass the way he did on tape. And I hope to God he does. So that's going to be the video, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. See you on the far side. Peace.